morning. Uh, my name is Adam Carroll. I'm an attorney at Walcott Rivers Gates, and I uh, do a fair amount of real estate closings. Um, and so the purpose of today's get together is to walk through some issues that I typically see agents um, struggling with through uh, difficult home closings. Um, and a lot of things that, that you can do in advance um, when you're in the contracting phase and through the transaction process can really help your buyers or sellers have a much better experience, be happier with you, and then make the closing process go a heck of a lot uh, more smoothly. Um, so anyway, my name's Adam Carroll. For those who haven't met me, uh, you will have um, my uh, email address and direct phone number and my assistant's contact information um, through Austin. Uh, he'll get that, those, that information to you and um, feel free to use it. Uh, one of the, the basic services that I offer agents that um, try to have their closings performed at my office is, you know, if you're in the middle of a contracting process and you have questions, you know, you have my direct line and reach out to me and, and, and ask me uh, for, to weigh in on how to draft a particular contingency, which is one of the things that we're gonna talk about today. Um, you know, or if you're having some difficulty with a septic system or, you know, some of the hot button items in the winter time, not too common around here, but sometimes they arise with, say, like um, a tank and with uh, oil in it, uh, the home's all heating oil, uh, what to do with that. So, again, um, so feel free to use that resource at any time. It's no problem. So, so today we're going to talk about a couple of things with pre-contract drafting and contingency drafting. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about dispute resolution, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we're gonna talk a little bit about surveys, why they're important, and how they can help a title policy. Um, so, so basically, just from a concept standpoint, a contingency in a contract is an event that if it occurs, uh, will cause the obligations in the contract to become enforceable. So the typical contingency that we see in residential transactions is a buyer contingency for the sale of their home. So um, a lot of times buyers, I'm sure you know this, will not have the capital that they need to close on a house that they wanna buy without first selling their home. And so they want to entice a seller into a sale at a price, but, but they say, listen, seller, I've gotta sell my home first before I can buy your home need to have that money to buy your home. Uh, and so the contingency is, is, is drafted. Um, the RAIN contract has a uh, contingency language in it and there's contingency addendums available to you. Um, but a couple of things that, um, that are nuanced with uh, sale of home contingencies that you should consider and I like to walk through with people are, are what are called kickout provisions and non-kickout provisions. Um, so a, a kickout provision is where a seller reserves the right to continue to market the property while the contingency is still unfulfilled. So in that circumstance, I'm buying a house um, from Austin, let's say, okay, and I say, Austin, I got to sell my home before I can buy yours, so I need a contingency. And in that circumstance, if you're representing the seller, right, you might want to think about including these kind of kickout provisions to say, okay, well, I'm all right with a contingent contract, but my seller needs the option to continue to market the property. And there's a way to draft a kickout provision where we would say that if the seller during that market time while the contingency is still unfulfilled receives another offer that it likes, Right, so Austin receives a non-contingent full price offer, close in 30 days, cash deal, beautiful offer, right? So if that happens, we wanna be able to tell that contingent buyer, sorry, buddy, I can't wait around any longer, I gotta close. And so we draft this kickout provision in such a way that if the seller provides notice that it received a better offer uh, during this time frame that it can continue to list and show the property, that it gives notice to that contingency buyer and says, buyer, you have, and the contract would set this up, you have X amount of days or hours or minutes or whatever it is to remove your contingency and proceed to closing. 
So it gives the buyer the ability to essentially have a first rights close, but they got to remove the contingencies. So that's a really seller favorable type of provision. Uh, there's, and we call I, I call that a kick out provision. So there's a, because you get to kick out the first, but your first buyer to go to your option. There's enough, and the other way to draft these home sale um, contingency provisions is to also consider that your seller can't be married to this buyer forever, right? So not to get too thick on you, but in, in contract law, there's uh, things called the implied duties of good faith and fair dealing and things like that. Virginia is not a state that necessarily recognizes that as a very aggressive duty. Um, there's arguments that it exists, there's arguments that it doesn't, but what, the way I would operate is this, is as a agent representing a party in one of these situations, you've got, you can't assume that everyone is going to charge forward with their contingency obligations and do them, you know, as aggressively as maybe your client might wish. And so when we draft a contingency provision for a, without a kick out, so without the option to continue to list, without the option to accept another offer and boot the other guy out, what we need to do is put a time frame where the contingency expires so your seller can get back to the business of selling his home. Um, and so if you're representing a buyer, right, uh, you want to consider if you're confronted with that type of option that either the buyer needs to have a contract ready to go with a closing date um, by a certain date, you want to try to caucus with your buyer and make sure that your buyer is realistic with the market time on his property, um, whether they're pricing it adequately, whether they need to get more aggressive to sell it based on what the seller is willing to do and how long the seller is willing to wait for the buyer to close and, and have, not close, but have a, have a contract on their home they need to sell. Um, market will dictate those time frames. Uh, there's no rule of thumb, there's no golden rule. If it's a hot seller market, contingencies are not going to be favorable. But if it's a slower market and buyers have more power, then you know the seller just might be happy that they got a contract. So market conditions will really, really dictate those sorts of things. Um, another thing we don't see as often, but it does happen, is the reverse, right? So you've got a fairly hot seller market and you know, the seller says, well, let's just stick a sign in the yard and see what happens. And they pick a price on their property that they would love to get, but you know, they don't think they will. And they get a full price offer that weekend. Okay. Um, that happens, right? It doesn't, maybe not so much these days, but it's happened plenty. And so then you've got a seller that goes, oh no, uh, I got my dream offer. It's a 45 day close. I don't have anywhere to go. Right. So there are provisions that if you are um, representing a buyer or a seller in those situations that you would want to consider putting into a contract. Um, it's basically the same thing that we just talked about, except instead of having this duty to list, right, what you do is you have the, the seller's duty to perform, meaning sell the property, being contingent on the seller finding the suitable replacement home. And that's where it gets really nebulous, right? I and mean, that's where it gets kind of touchy feely because a suitable replacement home to me may not very well be a suitable replacement home to your buyer or what your buyer thinks is a suitable replacement home. But I, you know, I found a lot of times that that discretion really needs to rest typically on the seller. So if you are representing sellers in a situation like this, you know, you want to really dig your heels in and say, listen, you know, suitable to you may not be suitable to me, but, but my seller is the one that's got to live there. And so they need the discretion to pick the home they need to pick. And in the event the seller's not uh, contracted or placed a contract on a suitable home within a certain date or time, then what happens, right, is the seller has the right to back out of the contract. That's typically what happens. And then, of course, the buyer gets his deposit back in that scenario. Um, a lot of times, how we draft these is, and if you're a buyer, what you want to do 
representing a buyer in a situation like this is if the seller has the right to terminate and say, I haven't found a suitable home in the 30 days that you allotted me. And so I'm sorry, buyer, I'd love to continue to, to, to sell you my home if you're willing to renegotiate this period. Um, let's do it. You know, let's reduce the purchase price by five grand, but extend the time that I have to find a suitable home by 30 days, you know, something like that. You can, you can always negotiate and always do addendums. But what you want to do in the situation where you represent a buyer in this scenario is you want to be able to force the seller to act, right? So seller, if you don't have a suitable replacement home contracted for in 30 days, you're excused from the contract or you got to tell me about it in writing. Okay. But if you don't, then that contingency is deemed waived and waived and we're going to proceed to closing in the ordinary course. We're going to get going right now. I'm going to order my home inspection, my termite, get all that stuff rolling, get my loan squared away. So you want to make sure your buyer has rights because most of this stuff is about timing. Right. I mean, people, when they're buying a house, got a lot of work to do in a compressed period of time. And it's stressful and they got loans and lock rates for buyers and all of that stuff. So people to move, kids to move, furniture to move. So we got to make sure that our, our clients are protected by the contract language so they know what to expect. Because, you know, I'm sure mo mo most of the more experienced agents will, will tell you that the, the worst thing that can happen in a transaction is if a buyer or a seller expects one thing and another thing happens. And, you know, I, I do my very best when I deal with these uh, clients at closing and in the run up to the closing process to make sure that they understand that the agents can't always predict everything and that there are things that happen outside of their control and that, you know, as long as they continue to communicate, then you know, most problems can be resolved because the seller wants to sell and the buyer wants to buy. And that's the only thing that really matters. The rest of this stuff can get worked out. So um, communicate, 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 set expectations and, and good contracting language will help you do that. Um, and again, if you need any help with it, call me. Um, so that really in a nutshell, and those are the examples that I prepared today. Um, it is, is a, the real good reason to have a good contingency language is to set the expectations of your buyers and of your sellers to avoid problems down the road. Okay. Um, so I will move on from pre-contracting and uh, drafting to dispute resolution, right? So it doesn't happen all the time, but this is what you need to be aware of generally in dispute resolution. Um, what happens if the, deal blows up somebody's fault right uh, and there's a fight over the deposit or there's a seller who is really pissed that they had an expectation to sell this property and it didn't close right now they they've got a property they want to buy they've got plans for them to move and they're in a really bad spot the difference in remedies uh, is is very very different to a buyer and a seller okay um, the typical remedies that a buyer has if a seller defaults is to compel the sale of the property. It's called specific performance. And sale of property and property in general is, is unique under the law. There's, the law considers a piece of property, every piece of property to be different. And because property is so unique, a buyer has the ability to force it and say, I'm ready, willing, and able to perform my obligations. And those are important. Those three words are very important. Because what happens is if I represent a buyer, you bring a buyer to my office for a closing and the seller, and the seller starts to play. What we do is right before closing, we send a ready, willing, and able letter. We say, we are ready to perform. We are able to perform. Here's my letter from my loan officer saying all they're waiting on is the seller documents. The loan is ready. The loan is funded. We are ready to go. And you guys haven't delivered us a deed for whatever reason. And in that instance, because you're ready, willing, and able to perform, your buyer can, if the buyer really wants to, go through the expense of forcing that sale, which is through litigation. And unfortunately, the rain contract, there's alternative dispute resolutions like uh, you know, mediations and stuff like that, um, which is not very effective, um, but it is what we, it's what we got. Um, so on the other side of that, you've got a seller where a buyer flakes, and that is the, the typical, more typical circumstance. And the seller is 
madder than a hornet and wants to know what they can do about it, right? And so you guys are not going to be able to answer that question effectively. It usually falls on me at closing. And the standard answer that I give is, well, you can do a lot about it, but it has nothing to do with today, right? This contract is over. It's been terminated. I am not going to let you, Mr. Seller, sign one of those rain releases where we don't do that because the rain release also has a liability release. And so what I do is I get the buyer to agree that the deposit is forfeited to the seller. So at least there's something, but I do not release that buyer from any liability whatsoever under that contract. We just need it released because the MLS right requires the release in order for us to relist and they got to get back to the business of selling at home. And then what I tell the seller is what you need to do is you need to figure out how aggressively you need to sell this property. And whether you got to drop the price or whether you've got to, you can carry it for a couple of months and it's no big deal. That's a, a fact by fact situation. But the reason why we need to get it listed quickly is because the seller's remedies against that buyer who flaked is to recover the difference in purchase price. So if you, had a $300,000 contract, it flakes, and then you go to sell it to somebody else and all you can get in the market is 280. And that's easy, right? You should have gotten 300. You actually got 280. So that's one measure. of damage. The next measure of damage is the carrying costs. So if you had the contract for 300, that's supposed to close on January 1st, but your 280 contract closes in June 1st, you were supposed supposed to be out of that property six months earlier, right? You've got six months of taxes. You've got six months of principal and interest payments. You've got six months of the escrows, like the insurance, right? So you have all those carrying costs associated with continuing to have that property that you shouldn't have had. So that's another measure of damages for a seller. Um, now going back to buyers for a minute, right? Post-closing, they get in the house and First person they call is the agent and they're madder than a hornet again because the seller, they think, hid damages, right? There's mold in this house. Uh, my allergies are going crazy. Um, we went back into the closet and removed a panel and it's all wet under the house, stuff like that, right? Um, what, I mean, mold is the biz biggest example. That's the most I get called on is, is someone has a reaction to mold that's in a home. Um, it's a tough case. All right, so in Virginia, the old principle of what's called caveat emptor, buyer beware, is alive and well. And the burden of proof that a buyer has to go after a seller post-closing is pretty darn high. The buyer's got to establish active concealment, right? Because most contracts that you're gonna do are gonna have a home inspection. And the law says that, look, if you've got a home inspection, you had an opportunity to discover everything that you needed to discover here. And so, because you had that opportunity and because the overriding principle of buyer beware is alive and well, buyer, you should have done better. You had the opportunity to discover it and you didn't. And the only thing that's going to, it's going to, to modify that rule would be certain express warranties in the contract, which we don't really have time to go through all of those today, but maybe in a subsequent training we can. But then the other thing is what's called active concealment. And so that happens when a seller hides it or tries to hide it and we can prove it, right? Now, look, you know, we may suspect all day long that a seller did something to cover up a condition in the home just to get it sold. I mean, right, that happens a lot fresh paint, your carpet, you put some kills on the wall to hide that wet spot, you know, stuff like that, stuff happens. Um, proving it is a different story, right? So active concealment is what's required. And, what, and the way you want to think about active concealment is, you know, would my home inspection fa have found it, but for what the seller did to hide it? And so that kind of dispute resolution gets really nasty. It gets really expensive because usually it involves experts, especially with mold. Um, so anyway, it's, a, it's, it's something to keep in the back of your mind.
Um, there are professionals that I've dealt with for years that I think do a really good job on home inspections. Um, you know, you, you typically, and this is usually a question people ask, well, if my home inspector missed it, maybe, maybe I go after him, right? He should have done a better job. He should have found it. Well, most of those home inspection contracts have a limitation of liability in them for the total amount of money that you paid for that home inspection contract. So if you paid a guy 250 bucks to go look under the house and give you a report about what needs to be fixed, usually those, your extent of your damages is $250, okay? That's called liquidated damages. Um, and those are enforceable provisions. So everyone's trying to cover their rear end. Okay, the one who's really out in the wind is the buyer in that situation. Uh, so we just got to make sure that they look at it and they're happy with it and they realize there's going to be a limited ability to go back on the seller after closing. You want to finish these issues at closing or have, if there's open items, escrows set up to hold seller money back to finish projects. Um, so let's see. The other thing that we should probably touch on is on dispute resolution before we do survey and title is deposits. Um, normally it's not a big deal, right? But if you do have a closing that falls apart and nobody will agree what to do with the deposit, it is the escrow agent, which is typically my law firm, when you close with me, uh, is responsibility to interplead the money. And that is a process that nobody likes. I'm actually doing one right now. And it's, unfortunate that people can't just say hey it's 500 bucks let's agree hey it's 2000 let's carve it up let's just move on with life because when they can't do it i as the escrow agent even though i'm representing say the buyer in the closing or the seller in the closing if the parties appoint my law firm as an escrow agent and we're wearing a different hat at that point i'm still representing you in the closing but i'm also been picked as the trustworthy party to hold the money and so when that happens and people can't agree what to do with the money post-closing, then I'm, the law says that I shouldn't choose, right? Because I open myself up to liability. You get two people claiming the same pot of money. If I pick, I'm going to get sued, right? And then it says when two the law says when two people pick an escrow agent like that, the escrow agent shouldn't be in that position. And so the escrow agent takes the money, kicks it into the court and says, hey, judge, you figure it out. <laughs> okay, I've got no responsibility with deciding who this belongs to, although I may think I may have an opinion who it should go to. I shouldn't be in a position to make that call and expose myself to liability. So we kick it into the court and the court decides ultimately. Now the real big drawback, especially when we have small deposits, a lot of the deposits that I see, you know, are 500 bucks, right? Um, is that when I interplead, the court will repay me my costs for having to do that. So the $46 filing fee and the $21 service fee, right? And you got $500 that eats away at those expenses. And typically, and I usually don't claim this unless it's a larger deposit, is they will pay me attorney's fees too. The law says that I should get my attorney's fees. I can tell you pretty darn quickly at 350 an hour, which is my typical litigation rate, that a $500 deposit will not exist anymore if I interplead. So, you know, I usually don't do that. Um, if it's a $5,000 deposit, then I probably would. But a $500 deposit, whatever, that's a risk that I choose to take for doing the business that I do. Um, so that's dispute resolution. Hopefully you guys never have to deal with it and you have perfect closings with no contingencies and, you know, giant commissions. So. Um, so the next thing that we should kind of talk about is, because I always say it at closing, I don't want the agent to be in an uncomfortable position with their client. Because a lot of times in a closing that has no problems, the first time I really talk to anybody involved in the closing is going to be at closing, right? Because if everything's going smooth, my real estate staff handles it, and it, it just kind of clicks along. So, but what happens though is when I sit down at closing, I'll look at them and say, did you get a survey? And, you know, a lot of times they want to save some expense. They don't want to drop the 250 or 300 bucks it takes to get a survey. And I'll go, all right, well, we always recommend you get a survey, but I know people make that decision. But, you know, had you gotten a survey, then I could have walked through some things with you on the survey and shown you uh, either 
items to look out for or uh, enhance your title coverage. Um, you know, I, I've, I've bought plenty of houses in my life. I always get a survey and I've never had an encroachment, uh, but I've done so many real estate closings, it pops up. You know, the guy's fence is on, the next door neighbor's fence is on your property or your fence is on theirs or there's a shed that was put out there that's not permitted that's within a setback line or, you know, something like that, right? And so in the event that you have that survey and there is one of those issues, the first thing my real estate staff does is walk it down to my office and they say, hey, look, there's an encroachment, right? I pick up the phone, I call the buyer or the seller, whoever side I'm on and say, hey, there's an encroachment here. We got to call the selling agent and get it fixed, right? Hopefully the two people are good neighbors and we can get a license or something like that or, you know, we, we got to make the seller fix it if it's their fault. So uh, th that way, when you buy a property, you don't buy a problem as a buyer agent. Um, so it's important, I think, to get a survey. Um, and even if there's nothing and the likelihood of encroachment or issues that arise on a survey is pretty low, which it candidly it is, it's low. Okay, Most properties are put together fine um, and, and don't have encroachments. But it, you know, for me, I like having them. You know, when I, I just bought a house not too long ago and, and I'll pull out the survey every now and again and look when I'm doing some landscaping and say, you know, how far can I really go on that side without pissing my neighbor off or something? Uh, if I want to put a shed up or something like that, it's nice to have. Um, and if you ever do, ever do any landscaping work, it's the first thing they ask you for is, hey, do you have a survey, right? So it's helpful to have. Um, the other thing a survey does is, is when you have an owner's title policy, and in my opinion, there is no reason for a buyer to ever buy a piece of property and not have owner's coverage. Um, the risk associated with not having an owner's policy and having a title defect, again, is, is relatively low. Most properties don't have title problems, um, but you know what? They're out there. And it's a one-time fee. It's built into the good faith estimate when they do their loan application. Uh, it's not a surprise. Usually, we do better than the quotes that the loan officers give them on fees anyway. And it really is something that if you have it, it follows you for your ownership of the property. And if you don't have it and you need it, you wish you had it. Because fixing title, proper, title problems is very expensive. I mean, very expensive. And if you have a title company involved and a insurance policy is issued, uh, they will hire the lawyer, they will deal with the problem. And I can damn well tell you that Fidelity litigates aggressively, I mean, very aggressively. I do title issues all the time. I do title litigation all the time. And I fight with Fidelity all the time. And I'm a, my, my title company writes through Fidelity and we still have to fight them, right? Um, they just, they're just aggressive. And so that's good when you have a title problem. One, they're going to have a lawyer that's got your back, your client's back, and they're going to try to fix it or they're going to pay out the issue and, you know, it'll be resolved that way. So it gets resolved one way or the other, as opposed to a homeowner having to deal with some issue with a boundary or with an easement or with something that a survey would have shown, right? And you would have had coverage for, but for the lack of a survey. So uh, I would recommend to all of your people get title insurance get the enhanced policy get a survey it all makes those things a heck of a lot better so that's my presentation for today i hope it was helpful um if i think uh, austin may have some q a uh coming up here uh kind of just to help flush out a few issues but i would say that if there's anything that you do have that you want to know more about from the perspective of a closing attorney or the legality behind agency or representing a buyer or a seller, just let Austin know and we can put something together more specific to what you want to hear about. Yeah. Thanks Adam. That was a, uh, that was super awesome, man. There, there was a lot of stuff I learned in that. That's uh, <laughs> that is so cool. Um, so I, I came up with a couple of questions, um, but the very first one I want to touch on are buyer broker agreements, because I know we see a lot of issues with that. Yeah. Um, so what kind of things can an agent expect if they get a buyer broker agreement signed and they go out, show a house, and then uh, uh, that buyer just goes to them and then buys a house with someone else? 
Um, what can that agent do if they got that buyer broker agreement signed? So, it, well, it's, it's going to really depend factually on a lot of a lot of things, right? But the first thing that you want to do if that really does happen is you send it to me, right? Because what we're going to be able to do is we're going to be able to determine the remedy pretty darn quick. But if you've got a buyer broker agreement, I mean, uh, I guess the, the pitfall if this happens often, I, I hope it doesn't, but if it does happen, um, you need to be aggressive, you need to be aggressive quickly, and you need to enforce your rights because the the contract itself, right? I mean, are you, are you talking about if it's post-contract or pre-contract? Uh, so uh, pre-contract to a house. So right. all you did was show it, you didn't write an offer or anything. Yeah. So right. so what's going to, so the big thing is, is that you're, you're talking about commission procurement, right? And whether or not you're going to be as the, uh, as the agent entitled to a commission for the property that that buyer ultimately buys with another agent, right? I mean, that's basically the question, right? Right. So again, that's a really nuanced area of the law. And maybe we should do a follow-up one of these on just commission entitlement. Sure. But essentially what will happen is you're going to have to have some measure of follow-up. And one of the things that you can do to prevent a client from ghosting on you and going somewhere else, or at least to set yourself up for the ability to have a claim to the commission, is when you speak to that particular client, right, and you get engaged, you have it signed, have a conversation about what they're looking for generally right? Where are you looking? What school districts are you looking? What price point are you looking at? Then jump on MLS and shoot them an email of 30 or 45 properties that meet that metric and say, here's a whole bunch. I'm working hard for you, right? Here's a whole bunch of properties. Why don't you and I take a look at some of these and whittle it down to 10 and we'll go see them on Saturday, all right? So what, because that's the point where you're saying I'm responsible for getting that client interested in a particular piece of property and so once you have that book and once you have that engagement you're set up oops can you see me Austin? yeah my yeah. my black for a second you're okay. set up for a heck of a lot better argument down the line that from a commission standpoint you should be entitled to a commission or a partial commission now i will tell you this though practically speaking when you have that kind of a dispute Nine times out of 10, the way it resolves is, well, the other agent did all the work and they've got an entitlement too because they didn't know about you, right? And so we end up calling the brokers and the brokers work it out and say, listen, we'll split it or we'll take, you know, a convenience fee or something like that. And, and it ends up getting worked out for the brokers a lot of times. Okay. With, with some help from the lawyers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I, I think a commission entitlement would be a really good one. Um, there's yeah. a couple questions from stuff that you touched on. Um, what is the length of time it generally takes to uh, solve a title issue? I know you said it's super expensive, but is it so, a super long process? Yeah, so it depends on the type of title issue. I can tell you that I'm doing one right now that's going on two years. Wow. And that's where a, when they cut a piece of property to, to make, it was a, it's out in the county, right? And so there's a large track of farmland and then somebody cut a sliver out for a home. Mm -hmm. And when they did the final plat, I swear to Christ this happened. Somebody must have like clicked the mouse on accident and dragged the line. The line went like, eh, like this. And the result of that is the corner of this guy's house, his pool and his detached garage are on my client's property. And so, hey, man, move your house, right? <laughs> and so, and, you know, and, and is that really going to happen? No, but it's litigation and it's going on. And I think we got it worked out now where there's going to be a, a settlement payment. We're going to agree to to let the house stay there. But, I mean, I'm telling you, like, that kind of stuff happens, right? And thank God that, I mean, for the other side, thank God they had a, a title policy because at least there's insurance coverage, Right. right. All right, and then so, uh, those issues, up, take, let me just back up. So yeah. Issues like that can take forever. Issues yeah. on ownership are a little easier because, you know, sometimes most of the, the, the problems with title come up where you'll have a seller sign a contract with your buyer 
and they don't own all the interest, right? right? And so a lot of times we can fix those super easy by, by jumping in and, and like finding the errors and fixing those so you can get to a closing. That's really a pre-closing title issue and not a post-closing title issue. Post-closing title issues are nasty. Yeah. Josh. All right. Um, so you talked earlier on how the buyer, if it gets to the point where they can force the sale, um, like yeah. if the seller defaults and you're so close, buyer wants to pursue that. What's mm -hmm. the typical cost uh, for the buyer to force that sale? Pretty significant. I mean, it'd probably be in the tens of thousands of dollars to get it done. But the good thing is, is typically there's an attorney's fees provision in that. And so, uh, you know, it'll shift. So if you win, right, which you should in that circumstance, I'm ready, willing, able to purchase, you tender, you, you know, do everything you're supposed to do. Um, and it's still not conveyed for whatever reason, right? And you get a specific performance order Specific performance is such a significant remedy that if the contract allows the recovery of attorney's fees, which most of them do in that circumstance, um, you'll also get an award for attorney's fees. Now, who's paying that fee? Is that the seller then? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Gosh, what a nightmare. It's a bad day. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. And then uh, one last question. Um, so if the buyer wants to back out and the all the contingencies are gone and now the seller is trying to recover the price difference, the carrying the cost and all mm -hmm. that. Um, I mean, that's all going to be on the buyer and sued to the buyer, correct? Yeah, you're going to sue the buyer. Yeah. Okay. And now, then your agent claims too, theoretically, right? Right, I mean, right. The agency is going to say, hey, that should have closed. You know, where's my commission? Right. right. So this buyer is going to get sued and just say it's like $30,000. What if this sure. buyer doesn't have $30,000? What what happens in that case? It's an economic decision, right? And so if it's $30,000, then you, and you have a conversation with somebody like me, I'm going to say, hey, look, you're out 30 grand. It sucks, right? But the jurisdictional limit in general district court is 25,000. Let's file it there because it's only going to cost you like 2,500 bucks at most to mm -hmm. litigate in general district court on an issue like this. And so let's file it there. Hopefully we ring the bell for the full 2,500 plus attorney's fees, you know, a whole bit. And you know, you, you're waving five, but you get swifter justice in general district court than you ever would in circuit court. I tell people that you can't get out of circuit court litigation for less than $30,000. It just, it just, for whatever reason, it's more expensive I mean, these kind of cases probably not honestly, but can be right. So the, the question is what if the buyer doesn't have the money? That's where right. you make an economic decision because all a judgment is, is a piece of paper. You have to be able to enforce it. Right. And debt collection. I mean, we do it all the time here, but it can be frustrating. It can be a long haul. And a lot of times, the seller in that situation needs to make a decision of whether they want to throw good money after bad money, right? You know, money in my pocket's better than money that I might get down the line usually. And so, you know, what I typically do is I just make sure they have a clear understanding of cost, time, and the ability to collect. Because once it goes into a collection department, then there's a 33% fee usually. Um, it's, uh, it's, a bad, it's a bad day all around. Gosh. Yeah, that, that sounds, uh, yeah. sounds super Litigation rough. is never the answer. And I no. litigate. Not, not at all. Is never the answer. I know yeah. I kind of cut my nose off with that, but I mean, really? that's my. But yeah. I'm telling you, when it gets to litigation, really, the only people that win are the lawyers. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. I, I guess uh, the only thing you could do in that instance as the agent would be telling the buyer, it's like, hey, look, we are in breach. The seller can sue. He's going to sue for these damages. I mean, it, it looks like it's going to be roughly around twenty thousand dollars. You know, the down payment's only going to be six thousand. Do you want to do the down payment of six thousand, buy the house, rather than losing twenty thousand and not even getting the house? Yeah, yeah. So it, yeah. it makes I mean, sense. I, I would try to stay away from giving legal advice, like we're in breach and things true. like that. True, but. true. <laughs> Talk to Adam, but yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much. No, this has been a uh, great info, and uh, I think we should definitely do a follow up, especially on commission sure. entitlement, um, because I know there's always problems with buyer broker agreements and. Uh, I know it's a bunch of gray lines, but real estate is a ton of gray lines, period. So thank you so much, Adam. Yeah, of course, man. Yep. And uh, I'll go ahead and uh, put your contact info with this video, too, so everyone can always uh, check you out on YouTube. Sounds great. Thanks, man.
All right, take care.